Excellent. All right, we are recording and welcome everyone. I'm Mark Pinto here at Phoenixville Public Library, welcoming you to tonight's Backyard Composting 101 talk. Uh, before we get into the lecture, thank you to all the partners in the Community Gardening Around the Village uh, series that we've been doing. This is uh, number two in the series. Uh, thank you to Penn State Extension, Phoenixville Communities That Care, Phoenixville Recreation, Camp Hill, Kimberton Hills, Phoenixville Hospital, Phoenixville Area Transitions Living Landscapes, Phoenixville Area Positive Alternatives, and Steel Town Village. So uh, we will be taking your questions in the chat during the presentation tonight, and we'll give you the opportunity to unmute yourselves uh, at the end to ask any questions. So we welcome now our host with the compost, Tom DeMauro, who is a trained master composter and also a middle and high school science teacher. Tom, welcome, take it away. Thank you, Mark. I like that, the, the host with the compost, I like that. <laughs> um, so welcome everyone, thank you all for being here. My name is Tom DeMauro, I am a volunteer at the Reservoir Park Community Garden um, and uh, I'm also a science teacher. So. Um, I'm going to talk about myself just for like a quick second and then we'll get into the good stuff. I realized I deleted my about me slide. So I guess I'm just going to tell you instead of you seeing it on the screen. That's okay. So I'm a high school, I'm, I'm a middle school science teacher and I was a high school science teacher for eight years before moving to Pennsylvania this summer. Uh, so I now teach uh, at Pottstown Middle School. Um, although I was telling Mark earlier, I kind of, it's more that I teach for Pottstown Middle School because I haven't actually been in the school to teach there yet because we're all virtual right now. Um, but uh, but I've been teaching eighth grade science this year. Um, throughout my career, I've taught all kinds of science, biology, earth science, astronomy, chemistry, physics. Um, so I've got a, a fun background for that. Uh, I am a master gardener. I'm sorry, a master composter, which is different from a master gardener. Um, a master gardener is, um, it's, it's a program that you can do through the Penn State um, Extension. Um, and uh, that goes into a lot of detail about different components of gardening. Um, the master composter program that I participated in instead uh, focuses on the composting process. It's not as um, extensive of a course. It's um, uh, two, uh, two weeks worth of classes that I took um, and a, uh, a good amount of volunteering. So um, I've been with community gardens. Uh, I've worked at uh, farmers markets. I've presented at libraries. So, um, uh, oh, I also uh, started a composting program at the high school where I taught in Connecticut. So uh, I've got a good little background of uh, a lot of different um, experiences with composting and a little bit of gardening. Um, not a master gardener, I, just to clarify, not a master gardener, I'm a master composter, but um, definitely a, a, a budding gardener, if you will. All right, so let's see about getting started for today. Um, so how to Zoom. If you're not familiar with Zoom, uh, just some quick little guidelines you can follow. Um, we mentioned earlier, you can mute your mics, that's just to prevent feedback. Um, and you can turn off your cameras too, if you want, because that just might help your bandwidth so that you can um, see the video a little bit better on your end. Um, you can toss questions into the chat box. A lot of folks have already found that. Um, and I'm, I personally, I don't mind if you wanna unmute yourself um, and just ask a question. I'm used to uh, more of a dialogue with my students instead of just presenting a lot. So um, feel free to ask a question if you get one, that's totally fine. But um, I've got my chat box open on the side. So if any questions pop up, I'll try and address them um, as, as they come up. So today we are going to discuss a um, whole bunch of things about composting. So we'll start off with what are the benefits of composting? Why would you wanna do that in the first place? Um, again, a lot of people that jump into it are usually gardeners, um, but there's other reasons. Instead of just having uh, compost to put on your garden beds, there's a lot of reasons why you'd, why you'd want to compost, a lot of benefits to it. We'll go through what are the different options of home composting systems. Um, someone mentioned earlier, you know, concern about having room in their backyard to do it. And so there might be some options available. We'll talk about, you know, where you'd want to set it up and, you know, what kind of uh, bin you might want. There's a whole whole array of different selections that we'll go through. Um, we'll also talk about the balance of ingredients for good composting. So what kinds of things can you put in and what kind of, th kind of things should you not do? Um, uh, some uses for compost and also what are just some some solutions to common issues with composting you know are you getting pests does it smell bad um, you know that sort of so what can you do to to um, you know kind of solve some of those issues 
So what is compost? Let's start off with a definition from the US Composting Council, which yes, there is a composting council and they have a definition, uh, very official. It is the intentional controlled decomposition of organic materials to create a quality soil amendment, also known as humus. Um, it, has a couple of requirements. It needs to be broken down um, with microorganisms. It requires air and moisture. Um, and it is actually just an accelerated natural process. So um, there is that um, human component that goes into controlling it, managing it. It is intentional. Um, so, so it does take a little bit of care, a little bit of know of, of what to put in and how to manage it. Um, uh, so it is, it is you know, um, but it is an accelerated natural process. So why should we compost? Um, it looks like another one of my slides got deleted, but that's okay. So number three, I'll start off with, and then I'll mention one and two. <laughs> so um, when it comes to composting, a lot of folks that are jumping into it um, usually have a lot of food scraps that they are diverting away from putting into their garbage and instead putting into their compost bin. So what's really good about that is a reduction in the volume of waste um, that's going actually to the dump or to the incinerator. So the trucks aren't hauling as much, um, you know, volume and mass. I mean, it's pretty heavy too. You know, a lot of food scraps have have a lot of, um, you know, water weight to them. A lot of of um, um, weight that's that because of the moisture content. And so, by reducing that going to the dump, there's a lot of of uh, good benefits from that. Uh, it also reduces greenhouse gases because by sending less organic material to a landfill, um, there's less of it that's rotting. What's happening in a landfill is not the same thing that happens in your compost pile. In your compost pile, it's aerobic. Uh, it has access to oxygen. It has access to air. But in a landfill, it's it's you know, it's very anaerobic. It's, it just keeps getting squished and covered with more things. So it doesn't have access to the oxygen that it would need to break down um, in, in a certain way to break down aerobically. And so there's different kinds of gases that are produced. Um, and apparently landfills are actually the third largest producer of methane in the United States, according to the EPA, contributing about 15% of, of um, anthropogenic uh, uh, methane um, as a pollutant. So uh, let's see, what was one and two? That was focusing on the quality of our soil. So um, there's a lot of good nutrients in compost and I'll go into a lot of that in a second. So we didn't really miss much by missing the slide, that's okay. Uh, so what do you need for a compost pile? There's, there's four main components that go into a compost pile. Um, you need carbon, you need nitrogen, you need oxygen and you need moisture. And so those four in the right amounts, the right ratios, will lead to a really successful compost pile. So let's talk about the first one that everyone tosses into their compost pile. That's your food scraps. That's what everyone thinks of first. Or yard waste or something along those lines. That usually is gonna fall into the category of counting as greens or nitrogen. Um, and so greens usually kind of have a greenish color. If you think of like grass clippings, those are a classic example of, of green. So if you clean up your grass clippings after you mow, um, you know that's something that you can add to a compost pile. Um, also coffee grounds or tea. I know coffee grounds are brown in color, but because of their nitrogen content, we, we consider them to be green material. Um, food scraps and manures. Uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about manures and certain things that you can and, and should not put into your compost pile. Um, but what the, one of the benefits of greens is that they kind of, you can think of it as providing energy uh, to the pile so that it can break down. So if you add more, then it will break down a little faster. It provides the, uh, the microorganisms, the, the different fungi, the different bacteria with a lot of different food so that they can heat up the pile. It'll accelerate composting. But, uh, but again, that balance, we were talking about ratio just a second ago. Um, if you have just a pile of food scraps, it's just gonna rot. That's, that's all it's gonna happen. It's just gonna attract bugs. It's gonna attract pests. You know, you're gonna get a raccoon that comes through and fishes through your, you know, uh, fish bones. Literally fishing through it. You know, so uh, you do have to be mindful of what other things you're putting in. So everyone thinks of food scraps first, you know, or yard waste, but that's not the only thing that's gonna go into your compost pile. But let's talk about different examples of food waste. So. Uh, back in May, uh, it was this was in the early stages of, of COVID closure, so I was getting a little bored, so I decided to join Instagram, and, uh, and so I decided I would keep a log of my food scraps for a week. So this is day one of International Compost Awareness Week back in May, and, uh, and so this is the first day of me recording our food scraps. It was Sunday, and, uh, and so there were coffee grounds and filters, eggshells, there were a couple of garlic skins, some sweet potato peels, um, 
So, and yeah, and then the, the confession that it would probably be really weird because I'm just posting my garbage onto social media for a week. Um, but actually it was a pretty interesting turnout. A lot of folks were really interested in asking questions about it. So I think people like to kind of see like, what are other people throwing away? There's kind of that fascination with garbage. Um, so on day two, it was a banana peel, asparagus butts. Um, I don't know, I call them the butt, you know, the butt end of it, the, the bottom part. Um, an apple core, eggshells, citrus rinds, a lot of a lot of produce bits and pieces. Um, but yeah, more eggshells, uh, more coffee grounds, old spinach. It was just it was left over in my fridge and it wasn't going so well. It was getting kind of kind of gross and soggy, so it was time to put that into the compost pile. Um, more of my garbage that you didn't ask to see in the first place. Uh, some, some cabbage ends, uh, some eggshells, more coffee grounds, more banana peels. Um, and, uh, and so on day five, I was getting a little creative. And so I put some eyeballs on the eggshells. So uh, that was eggshells, some avocado skins and some coffee grounds. Uh, in case you couldn't tell, we definitely drink a lot of coffee in our house. So, <laughs> so you know, we recognize that there's, um, you know, a certain amount of, of food waste that you know, isn't really edible in a lot of ways, eggshells, coffee grounds, citrus rinds, banana peels, but it's still organic waste that we can put to good use. So that's the green material, but there's other stuff that needs to go into your pile, actually probably in a little bit of a higher amount and in a, in, in a stronger ratio. So in addition to the greens, which are food scraps, we also have brown material, which are, um, that's carbon-based stuff. So dry leaves, right now is a great time to collect your, your leaves, your dried leaves that have fallen um, you know, with, with autumn, collect them, put them in a pile, just put them in a pile wherever you got space if you, if you have it, um, and just stash them off to the side. If you want, you can you know, make a little pen with chicken wire to keep them in place. Um, but at that point, actually, it might even start to, to uh, compost a little bit throughout winter if you have a big enough of a pile. Um, but dry leaves, straw, um, I, I lean towards straw instead of hay because hay has seeds in it. So um, if you put seeds into your compost pile, they're, they're probably going to be really happy about being there, but then they'll get, they're going to germinate. So um, shredded paper, you can put paper in there. Um, definitely make sure you shred it up, you know, crinkle it so that it's not just flat and getting matted. Because if you end up putting just, you know, newspapers into your compost pile, they're actually kind of dense. So you gotta, you're going to want to mix them up um, because if they just get wet and matted, then it's just going to block off oxygen into your pile. Sawdust is also another really good thing that you can have. Um, it's also just a very, very um, carbon-based material, easy to mix in, which is really nice. Uh, you can also use wood chips. A lot of municipalities have access to free wood chips, um, and so those are a great um, um, source of carbon material as well. So it adds necessary bulk to compost. Um, it allows air channels, access to oxygen. It kind of fluffs it up a little bit. It, it, it changes the, you know, the physical quality of your compost. If there's too little, then the pile is not going to be able to breathe. There's going to be too much green, um, green material, and it's just going to start to rot. So um, having leaves in your compost is going to be really important, um, or straw, or shredded paper, or sawdust. Um, but actually, you're going to want to put it in the ratio of probably um, a volume of two to one for browns to greens. That's something I wish I put on my slide. Um, a volume of two to one. So you're actually going to have double the amount of brown material than you would green material in your piles. That's definitely something you're going to want to keep in mind. Um, moisture, <clears throat> very important. If your pile is completely dry, it's not going to really break down. Moisture is going to be able to support those microorganisms, um, those little fungi and, you know, uh, actinomycetes, the different little um, microorganisms that are going to break down some of that denser carbon material. Um, so water is going to be really important. If you squeeze your, your compost pile, the stuff in process, um, then you're going to uh, probably wring it out like a sponge, you know, so 45 to 65 percent moisture. Not that you're going around measuring that specifically, but if you wring it out, you should you should be able to feel some moisture in it. If if your compost pile is too dry, um, easy things to do is add more green material. So things like yard waste, food scraps, that kind of stuff. Um, you can just add water, um, or you know consider the size of your pile. If it has more mass to it, then it's going to be able to retain that water a little bit better. Um, or you could adjust the shape of your pile. If you just got literally a compost heap in your backyard, um, you can try adjusting the shape of your pile so it actually catches the water a little bit better. Um, there are some you know, considerations. Maybe you have a bin instead of just an open pile. Um, so you're gonna wanna pay attention to moisture levels in a different way because some bins might actually contain their moisture a lot better. So you might not wanna add too much green material, but I'll talk about different compost bins and options about that in a, in a minute. 
Um, air, oxygen, very important for your pile. Um, either your food scraps are gonna break down um, aerobically or anaerobically. You want it to be aerobic. You want it to have uh, access to oxygen. Um, and you can accomplish that in a couple of ways. Turning it is a little exhausting. It can be, especially if you've got a big pile of stuff trying to turn it. Um, but, uh, but even just setting it up and making sure you have the right ingredients to it, like I said, including carbon-based material, dried leaves, wood chips, that sort of stuff will allow the pile to continue to breathe. Um, decomposition is a little faster. Uh, it produces water and carbon dioxide. So yes, it does produce carbon dioxide, but that is a natural process of cellular respiration. Um, and like it, it occurs naturally, it's on the forest floors. It's just that we are taking a natural process and accelerating it. If it happens anaerobically, that's when you're going to get probably a really stinky pile. Um, it might smell kind of acrid, a little bit like ammonia. Um, and, uh, and that's probably just because they're not getting the oxygen that they need. So they're not going through cellular respiration. Um, and so they're not able to, to break down those materials properly and just produce a bunch of bad smells. Um, so there's a lack of adequate oxygen. It might be matted. Um, so again, consider how you're mixing materials. Um, it might remain cooler in temperature. It'll break down slower. Um, you know, in certain settings, if it's anaerobic, it will produce things like methane or ammonia. Um, but uh, that's what it usually actually occurs in, in lakes and in oceans and landfills um, in places that don't have access to a lot of oxygen. Um, that's where you're going to find anaerobic respiration. So the thing like swamps, you know, how, how you know, that kind of swamp smell. Um, that's that's the kind of idea uh, that you'd get from an anaerobic pile. So usually you can just tell by smelling it. If, you, if it smells bad, then, um, you know, we'll talk about some solutions for that. But that's going to be a, a very clear way to tell. Just as a side note, if anyone has questions, feel free to interrupt. I don't think I see anything in the chat box, but I figured I'd just remind everyone. Um, yes, yeah, there is something in the chat box. Uh, there, Tom. Oh, um, I do see some, I don't think I see well, one for- Somebody, you know what, it was sent privately. Uh, the question is, question is, will I have to buy anything to add to keep my compost healthy? Um, no. Uh, so the first things that would come to mind for me would probably be you hear of those like compost starters, you go to the garden center and they probably have a little, you know, container and it's, you know, jumpstart your compost bin and it's got a mix of different kinds of fungi and uh, bacteria. Um, actually, the ones that would be good for these different stages, the little um, uh, the chart that I have on my screen is if your pile is at a good size and able to maintain some heat, it can go through the thermophilic phase and into the mesophilic. It's just basically it heats up and it cools down. But do I think you need to get a compost starter? Not really. Um, I guess maybe in certain situations, usually compost piles are in contact with the ground. There's some tumblers that are not in contact with the ground, but if it has contact with the ground, you're going to get the microorganisms that you need. Um, at that point, then it would just be what are the materials that you're adding in. So I used to buy a bale of straw, honestly. It was like five bucks at, at you know, a, a local um, you know, farmer's market, uh, just get a bale of straw and then I'd stash that. Actually, I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, I stash that next to my pile. Um, and then that's an easy source for me. Just take off a few, you know, um, sheets of, of straw and just toss them on top, break them up a little bit. But that provided a good way for me to, to layer, um, you know, as I'm putting in green materials, some more brown stuff. So, you know, you can, you can do this in a very cheap way, or you can go very expensive. And I've got some good examples of some very expensive bins coming up. So um, there's a, there's, it depends on, on what your interests are really, uh, but do you need it? Probably not. Yeah. Um, so, um, but I'll go into, like I said, some more examples of those. I got another question that just popped up. Uh, if you have a bin, do you recommend bringing it inside for the winter or is having it uh, against the house or under an awning enough protection? That's a good question. Uh, when it comes to the winter, I probably wouldn't worry about bringing a bin inside. Um, I'm assuming that you mean like an actual full compost bin. Uh, another bin that you could use would be a worm bin, which would actually just be a, more of a smaller bucket. Um, okay, so yeah, verma, vermiculture, if you can put it into your garage, that's probably gonna be a good spot. Um, if you can put it under your sink, that's probably gonna be better. Um, or if you do leave it outside, uh, maybe try covering it up. That might be a little bit helpful uh, to make sure that it's not getting too cold. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of what the winters are like here in Pennsylvania. I haven't actually had a winter here yet. Um, it gets you know, somewhat chilly. Um, I think it drops down to below freezing. Um, so 
I'd probably, if you can, bring the bring a vermiculture bin inside. I would probably do that. Um, that would be my recommendation. But if you weren't able to, you could put it outside. Um, maybe put a bunch of leaves on it, you know, so that it has a little bit of insulation um, so that you don't have to bring it inside, but it's insulated from the cold. So that might, might be a good solution for that. So something to consider. Um, hopefully that was a little bit helpful to answer that question. All right, so this was just a really nerdy uh, graphic that I put on the screen. Everyone probably looked at it already about the different stages that compost can go through. And I'm going to talk about the thermophilic phase um, a little bit later on and some fun applications for it. Um, but some things to keep in mind. So when you add stuff to your pile, um, use small ingredients, chop up big pieces to break them down faster. Um, at the, uh, at the uh, community garden at Reservoir Park, we have some pretty good sized um, uh, compost bins like those three sets made out of uh, out of pallets and uh, we really just toss a bunch of yard waste in there without chopping it up too much but I think it's also kind of under the understanding that it might take a second for it to break down if you chop up your bits and pieces though then it will probably be able to break down a little bit faster it will also be easier to turn um, which if you intend on aerating your pile which would be good to do um, it, that would that would make a big difference access to decomposers. Um, they are abundant uh, everywhere around you. Um, and all you got to do is just put some stuff there in the right ratios and they'll take it from there. Um, I don't like, like I mentioned earlier, I don't think you necessarily will probably need a compost starter in, I would say probably 99% of the settings, honestly. Um, I also mentioned earlier that the ratio of two to one for your browns to green. So as you're adding in a bucket of food scraps, grab some wood chips right there, toss them on top, two volumes worth compared to your greens. Um, and it does help to have a stockpile of browns. I think I have that on a, on a slide coming up. Um, so sawdust, uh, straw, leaves, something that's gonna complement your green material. When it comes to the uh, the, food web for your compost pile. Uh, there is a whole array of creatures that you'll see. I'll talk a little bit more about pests and which ones are not pests necessarily. That actually might be some welcome critters in your compost pile. Centipedes might weird you out, but they're not that bad. Um, but really the, the big star here are, are the first level consumers, if you will. Those are our, our decomposers. So especially the bacteria, the fungi, um, those are really going to be the, the, the big most important part of your compost bin. If you see worms in your compost, that is a good indicator of a healthy compost pile, but worms are not required in a, you know, a large outdoor pile. If you have something like a vermiculture bin, like someone mentioned earlier, uh, then yes, obviously worms are required. If you just put your food scraps into a bucket and just let it sit, it's just gonna attract fruit flies. So you need to make sure you do have worms in that situation. But in, in your own backyard compost bin, you don't need to have worms. In fact, uh, I won't go off on this tangent too much, but in fact, uh, a lot of worms, um, a number of them are actually invasive. Uh, you might not have realized that, but some of them are actually fairly dangerous for our forests and are actually starting to devour our forest floors. Um, but that's, I, that's probably another webinar. <laughs> um, but like I said, um, those microorganisms, those really are the star players. Uh, so how to, sorry about that little notification that popped up. So uh, how to save your scraps. This is what I do with my food scraps. I have a bucket. It's just a five gallon bucket and it's got a little twisty lid. That was my recent upgrade. I just dump my stuff in there and um, and then I can twist my lid back on. This was, a, a, a like I said, a big upgrade for me uh, because before I had to peel off the lid of a five gallon bucket and stick it back on and then peel it off and my fingertips were raw. Um, so this is much easier. I think the lid cost me like seven bucks for both pieces, the ring and the little twisty lid on it. Um, let's see. Uh, I got another um, uh, question asking, my sister does not put eggshells into her compost as she was told not to, uh, as it attracts rodents. Um, what are my thoughts? I put all my eggshells in. Um, what I would say is probably gonna be important is once you add things to your pile, once you add food scraps, cover it up. Um, don't, don't just add food scraps and then leave it exposed because that will definitely um, bring rodents around, raccoons. Um, so if you're just tossing food scraps on top, yeah, you could probably expect to get some pests. Um, 
But me, you know, I, if you want to, you could still save your eggshells, dry them out, crush them up, use them as a, you know, um, a, a soil amendment for your for your garden beds for, um, you know, for calcium. And also eggshells are good uh, if they're crushed up, you know, as a kind of an abrasive to deter slugs. So if you are getting a lot of slugs in your garden. Um, so me personally, I put eggshells in. Um, I don't have too much of an issue with rodents necessarily. I've had some open piles. Uh, that I've used um, without too much of an issue that I've noticed at least with, with rodents. Um, but my, my recommendation would be cover up your food scraps. That might be a good way to, to uh, prevent rodents from at least getting the smell. Brown material is really good at covering up that smell. So, um, but yeah, so this was just my little tip for if you're not sure what you need to get. Some people get like, you know, these metal, um, you know, under the sink or ceramic kind of little pots. And if you want to get that, that's fine. Um, I just went for a five gallon bucket and uh, probably every three to four weeks we'll, we'll fill it up. Uh, another question. So is attraction to critters the only reason not to put meat and dairy in the pile? Um, do they compost? Uh, so, so that's a good question. Um, meat and dairy, I would avoid in a backyard bin for that reason, uh, because of critters. But if you've got a big enough of a pile, um, then you can compost meat. Um, I've, I've tossed shrimp tails into my pile, along with the same idea with the eggshells. The, 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 the shrimp tails, I specifically dug a hole, dumped them in, and covered them up. Um, and that actually worked fine. I didn't notice any issues with, you know, any kind of critters rummaging through at all. Um, so, so I would be cautious for a beginning composter to toss meat or dairy or fats into your pile. Um, also because they have a different, you know, kind of chemical content. So things like fats are going to go rancid probably, and it's going to, going to, uh, you know, kind of mess with um, the chemical nature of your pile as well. So. But yeah, I mean, you can you can toss in meat, you can toss in um, dairy, but I would do I would do it with caution. Oops, we don't need to watch that again. Okay, so I guess that brings us to our next slide. Which what did I just say? First is now not for home composting, meat, bones, cheese, fat, and dairy, and that's the reason though is because you would probably attract pests. Um, but if you can bury it in your compost pile. Or if you have some some bins actually have like a closure to it. If you've got that, then that would be okay. But with meat and bones, um, you know, bones probably won't really break down all that quickly. So you're going to have to sift through your compost and take the bones out every time. Um, but if you if you intend on leaving your compost pile for like a real long time, you've got just a pile that you're going to leave as you know your source of where you're going to put meat and bones and really cover it up. Then that that might you could you could turn that into a science experiment if you wanted to. Um, but I would be, I would, I would be cautious, like I said, for a beginning composter uh, to do that. Metal and plastic, just not going to break down. Uh, pet wastes, um, especially your dog, your cat, uh, don't put those in for a couple reasons. One is because uh, they might, you know, not, not, they might have parasites, you know, that they would be more likely than, um, than herbivores to carry parasites because they're, they're carnivorous. So, um, and my dog just eats all kinds of crazy things off the sidewalk and I yell at her not to, and she still does it. So I definitely don't put my dog's waste into my compost pile. I don't trust my dog. She, she gets into too many things. Um, but yeah, pet wastes, I would not do that. Um, hay, because it has seeds, um, also weeds if they have seeds, um, or even weeds like Creeping Jenny or that kind of a thing, just be, be mindful that they might really find a good home in your compost pile. Uh, lawn waste that's been treated with pesticides or chemicals, um, because if you've got pesticides going into your pile, then you're going to really affect the community of, of microorganisms um, and little critters that are really the ones you want that are going to break down your pile. So I would try and refrain from that. If you're, you know, getting leaves from someone else, just check to see, you know, um, you know, if, if they're treating their yard in any way with any kinds of um, substances. And also, uh, compostable forks and plates, don't put them into your backyard pile because they will not break down. Um, there are uh, companies that will come by and collect food scraps and they've, you know, the, the whole composting companies, there's a couple in Philadelphia, I think there's some in, in this area as well. Um, but, uh, but they're generally able to take compostable things like forks and plates because there is a mechanical process that they, that the materials go through to help break it up. Um, and that just doesn't happen usually in your backyard. So uh, they, you, you probably wouldn't really notice them breaking down. Um, they're, they're a fairly hard material. Um, so I would, I would refrain from that. 
I see another question that popped up. Uh, what are my thoughts on adding spent garden plants? Um, I've heard not to as to not spread disease. If you know that your plants, um, it, you know, if they're they're dying because uh, you know they're wilting from a, a mold or a mildew, uh, yeah, I would be I would be cautious to do that. Um, in a lot of these situations, if your compost pile gets hot enough, uh, then it would actually be able to kill those microorganisms. Um, and so you would be able to add them to your pile. The issue with that is making sure that your pile is big enough to generate enough heat. Um, and if you want, you can get a thermometer, a giant thermometer to shove right into your pile if you, if you really feel nerdy about it to see how hot your compost is getting. That's a new level when you get a thermometer. Um, but when, you, when, when you're adding things like uh, spent garden plants. Um, yeah, I would be wary uh, to do that because um, I wouldn't want to continue to contaminate um, more of my soil with, with some of those molds or mildews or things that are wilting my plants. All right, so let's talk about different types of bins. Looking at my time right now, it's uh, 7.40. Okay, so still got some time. So there's two main categories of bins. You can either have open systems or closed systems. So an open system is just a big pile or a pen or, um, you know, if you go to the Reservoir Park Community Garden, you'll see some open systems with the, the pallets. You know, we've got a three bin system with, uh, made out of pallets. That's a good example of an open system. Closed systems, those are usually ones that you're going to have to buy. They might cost a little bit of money, but they do have some benefits depending on where you live, um, what your, your, you know, your situation is, um, your yard space that's available. Um, maybe a closed system is going to be a better bet in, in the end. Uh, things to consider, the climate, is it hot, is it dry? If it is really a dry climate, not so much around here necessarily, um, but if you were trying to do it in you know, the Southwest or something, you're going to want a closed system because that's going to help contain moisture. Um, but if that's not really a big concern, then and that, that, then it's not a big concern. Uh, for location, things like pests, smells, or aesthetics. Uh, if you live in an area, you know, more of um, an urban environment where you might, you know, uh, there might be different rodents or raccoons or whatever around, or even in a rural air environment, you know, you might have a lot of those pop up as well. That might be something to consider. Maybe you want a closed system. Uh, because that would prevent critters from being able to get into your pile, those larger pests. Um, and things for smells, uh, again, a closed system would help to conceal some smells, but if you have the right balance of ingredients, then that shouldn't be too much of a problem. Um, and aesthetics, you know, if you live on a, uh, you know, a street corner and everyone can see your pile, maybe think about just, you know, sprucing it up a little bit, make it look nice so that the neighbors don't think you have a pile of rotten garbage in your backyard. So that's something to consider as well. Some examples of open systems. Um, there's a three bin system using pallets. When it comes to pallets, you'll want to check the pallet to make sure that it isn't pressure treated. Um, usually there's a stamp on the side that will say if it's heat treated or pressure treated or that sort of a thing. So just if you're going to use pallets, just be mindful of um, how that wood, where that wood came from, what's happened to it before, uh, because you won't want any of those sorts of pressure treated materials to get into your soil. Uh, I have a geo bin, a picture of a geo bin in the middle. Um, I also have a geo bin set up at the Reservoir Park uh, Community Garden. Um, that's where we're, we have a little home uh, backyard uh, uh, demonstration bin. So if you want to see what that might look like in person, feel free to stop by. But I have a geo bin set up for that. What's nice is it's also expandable. It's basically just a big plastic strip that you, there's little closures on it and you can open it up or, or, or condense it a little bit. So if you need more space, you can kind of open it up a little bit. Um, or you can just get chicken wire and some steaks and you can just form a little, you know, kind of edge to it just to kind of keep your pile together so it doesn't continue to spill out, but that would help it to maintain its shape, its size, um, which might be beneficial uh, for maintaining some heat that would um, allow, uh, you know, composting to go at a, a faster rate. So some pros, some cons, easy to build. Uh, it's got contact with the soil. Uh, so you've got access to microorganisms, access to air and water. So that's pretty easy, um, but it's susceptible to weather. Um, so you might need to be mindful of that or accessible to pests or uneven de decomposition. What I mean by uneven decomposition is that the outside is gonna dry off first and the inside is still gonna be um, it's still going to have a higher moisture content. So that might mean you have to kind of mix it because the outer layers might not decompose as much as the inside stuff. So that might require some turning to do that. 
Uh, here's some more examples of open systems. Um, you know, if you want to get, you know, kind of a pre-made one, I saw a prefab three bin system ranging from 150 to $400. Uh, that's pretty easy to set up, but you know, it, it kind of comes with the cost, I guess. Um, someone's asking, what is the danger of it getting too wet if there's no cover? If it gets too wet, then it might not have enough access to oxygen. Um, you know, it's a tough balance because you want it to have moisture and you want it to have oxygen. But if it's just, I mean, if it's just drenched, it's just soaked, um, then it, that would probably be an issue. It might get, you know, at that point, it might just get matted. It might not break down the right way. You might not see the kind of quality result that you're looking for in the end. It might take longer to break down. Um, so if your pile is too wet, that's a situation where all you got to do is turn it, fluff it up, and that will help to get some moisture out of it. You can also add leaves, um, add something dry to help you know, kind of absorb some of that water and balance out the water content. Oh yeah, if you really want to go the freebie way, you just make a big fat pile. Um, that's what I got on the bottom of the screen. So uh, the recommended recommended uh, size for it is three by three by three feet, so a cubic yard. That will have enough mass to generate some heat and to actually help the pile to cook a little bit. It's not gonna get crazy hot, but it can get up to you know, 120, 130, 140 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is it, in winter, especially you open up that pile, you get all this steam that comes out. Um, that's, that's first off very satisfying to have happen, but that's, that's what's happening is it's, it's actually generating its own heat in that way. I'm just checking through the uh, chat box to make sure I didn't miss anything. Doesn't look like it. Cool, okay. So some closed systems, um, they're good because they're secure, but they also just cost a little bit more. Um, their appearance is really nice. They conserve heat, moisture, and nutrients. It's a fairly even decomposition because you don't have the edge drying out like you would in an open pile, um, but some cons. Uh, you might need a little bit more regular turning because it might need a little more access to, to oxygen with those sides. If it's a plastic bin, it just might not breathe as much. It'll, you'll still get compost out of that for sure. Um, but you might just might want to think about aerating it a little bit. Uh, limited capacity. Obviously, if you just got a big pile, you can keep adding to your big pile. Um, but if you've got a bin, you're kind of limited in your capacity a little bit. Um, also, incomplete biodiversity. Yeah, uh, that might be, especially if you have a tumbler, those are like the big barrels on their side that you can rotate. Um, you know, Again, that's a situation where people like to say, get, you know, get that compost starter that you can get at the garden center. Do you need to? I don't really think so. There's enough microorganisms in the air. Um, and just from throwing in your food scraps, from throwing in your leaves, they're on there. You know, you, you're not going to be able to avoid those microorganisms. So just by tossing them into a tumbler, you should be good to go. Um, worms, question mark, because depending on the kind of bin, you probably don't really need it. Again, for vermiculture bins, yes, absolutely. And make sure you have the right worms for it. Um, but in most situations, worms are an indicator, like I said earlier, of good compost and, and good quality soil, um, but they are not required for it. So, um, and it can be uh, difficult to add or take compost from a bin. That's what I mean by that. There are some bins that are set up, so it's really easy to, to you know, take it out of the bottom and just add more stuff up to the top. I think I've got a picture of that. Yeah, um, an earth machine is a good example of that. Um, there are some municipalities that have done uh, big drives, actually, big, uh, um, you know, bin distributions uh, where they'll, you know, reach out to their, the community and say, who wants a bin? We can get them in bulk for cheap. Um, and people are buying them from their, from their municipality for, you know, uh, 20 bucks, I think it was at the Coventry Farmer's Market back in Connecticut. Um, I was pretty surprised that they were selling them for 20 bucks. Uh, but that's a great deal. If you were to get one on its own, it could be 60 to to $100. But what I like about it is on the front, you might be able to see there's actually a little door that slides up right where that, that little pile of compost is. So you can actually pull up the door, dig out some of the stuff that's on the bottom, and, and on the top is a, is a twisty lid that you can pull off and you can just add more stuff onto the top of it. So I actually like earth machines um, for that reason is because it's a, like a nice little one-way street for compost. Uh, you're taking it from the bottom because that's where all the finished stuff is and you're adding more to the top so it can keep going. So it's nice. And then what's nice too is they're round so then you can spin it and then grab it from the other side, which is cool. Um, this, uh, these three bins were from a community garden in Manchester that I was helping out with as well. Um, and uh, you can see, I don't know, this was a stock photo that I found on Google for that lady on the left. I have no idea who she is, but that's a good example of another closed bin that you can use. Um, tumblers are another one that I was talking about, and I've got mixed feelings about tumblers. 
uh, depending on, on what your situation is. Some of them can be pretty expensive, um, like the one that I have shown on the screen. I've actually made one of those. It comes in a lot of pieces and it has some directions. Uh, so, you know, if you like building Legos, maybe that's the way to go for you. But, uh, but it can be a little, it might take it, you know, it takes a second hand or second set of hands to do that. Um, and, uh, and it might take you, I don't know, half an hour or so if you if you've got all the right tools. Unfortunately, when I built it, um, we were missing a few things. So we had to kind of uh, make it work as we went along. But that's fine. But yeah, hey, if you really want to go all out on your composter, you can get the cutest little composter in the world in pink. Uh, it is on Amazon Prime. Um, it is about $200. And it's really not all that big. And I don't think it's all that worth it. Um, it's aesthetically pleasing if that's what you're going for. And, and what's nice about it too is, yeah, okay. If you live in an apartment and you only have a balcony um, and you need to, you, you wanna try to get into, into composting a little bit, yeah, maybe, maybe you don't need to get the $200 one, but you know, something like a small tumbler might actually be a really good option in that case. Um, one thing why I'm a little bit iffy about them is they can get heavy and they can get kind of difficult to turn. So you can see in the, the picture that I've got on the left side, the lady's got a handle that she can use to crank to, to help mix stuff up. So that's nice instead of having to try and, you know, roll the whole barrel. I also see the other ones that go, um, you know, end over end instead of rolling, they kind of flip end over end. And those can be a little, a little tough to, to, to flip as well. Um, Cause if they just sit and they settle and then you got to flip it and you got to try and work against, you know, basically your, your compost body, you got to try and, you know, turn it all at once. So, you know, it depends on the this, this situation. There's a lot of good reasons to get a, a tumbler, a lot of good reasons to not get a tumbler. So it depends on, on what your interests are. Uh, other tools, I would recommend water resistant gloves. You can get gloves that you know are you know nitrile covered, so they're, they don't have latex. So if you have a latex allergy, that's something you can keep in mind. Um, uh, a pitchfork or a shovel, if you're interested in turning your pile, I would recommend it. Um, a food scrap bucket with a lid, like the one that I was showing you earlier, and extra browns. Um, so here is a good example of a straw pile that I had for extra browns at my old compost. Uh, been back in Connecticut. <clears throat> and so uh, you can see, I kind of circled it on the screen. There's just a, a pile of slightly um, rotted um, uh, straw that I think we we picked up for, it was like our wedding or something at the time, I think. And so we had we had it left over. So I was like, all right, I'm tossing it in the pile. Um, so, uh, so we were able to use that as a good source of brown material. Just take off the leaf, toss it on top. If you don't have access to something like straw, then a pile of leaves next to your bin is actually going to be really helpful. That might be something that a lot of people didn't expect is if you've got a compost pile, you also need a browns pile, basically. Uh, because as you're adding in that green material, you know, it's, it's that two to one ratio. You got to have the browns. If it's just green, it's just going to rot. So um, keep that in mind. And you can see way in the back over there, um, that was my compost pile. Uh, and uh, you can see the garden beds. We, we had just built, uh, just bef um, before I took this photo. This was back in May of 2019. So thank you to my parents for giving us a hand with that one. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you can see the pile is just kind of tucked in the back. It doesn't really matter necessarily where you put it. Um, you can put it in the shade, you can put it in the sun. Um, you don't need to put it in the sun. Some people think that that would help with the heat, but mostly the heat, the temperature of the pile is gonna be dependent on itself. Um, it's not really gonna be based on, you know, the environmental, the ambient temperature. That's not really gonna have too much of an effect on the temperature in your pile. Um, I, here's some more examples of composting at a municipal scale uh, in, in Manchester in Connecticut. Uh, all of our leaf uh, litter gets collected, you know, those leaf bags. And so the city comes and takes them and they toss them into these big piles. Um, so actually, I, I found that, um, you know, as I was setting up my own compost, it took a while for me to get some. So I just go to the municipal compost and, and, and take some of that. But it worked pretty well, actually. And they have these huge windrows and, and these big turners. And so uh, I got to say, I've, I've seen them in action a couple of times and uh, I, you know I'm waiting for that moment when when I instead of getting a you know a, a jet ski or a motorcycle or that's what I want that's going to be my my toy uh, that's what I'm going to ride around on so all right so some uses for compost first you got to know when your compost is ready really the my my simple recommendation is if you can't tell what you put in there it's probably done if you can still see what's in there, it's not done yet. So if you can still see banana peels, if you can still see, you know, apple cores, if you, uh, yeah, 
all right, eggshells aren't going to break down completely. They're not going to dissolve. So you might still see some little bits of eggshells. So those will be there. Um, but it should be, you know, dark brown or black in color. That's going to be, you know, really good, you know, carbon and nutrient dense uh, material. Should be soft, should be clumpy, should be crumbly. Um, you should, uh, if there are any small pieces like corn cobs or, um, you know, other things like that, like, yeah, a corn cob will eventually break down. So you can just toss it into your, into your, back into your pile. Um, and it, that's why I recommend sifting it um, also. That's another step. I mean, you don't, you don't have to sift. Um, I actually, I haven't really sifted compost all that much and it still goes fine. Um, at the community garden at, at uh, Reservoir Park, um, you know, I, I was able to get a lot of compost out of one of the piles um, and it's ready to use. I didn't sift it, but I don't, you don't really have to, but it helps to break up that material and make sure that you've got, um, you know, good uniform material that you're able to use. And it should smell earthy. You should get that really nice, you know, um, you know, forest floor smell out of it um, from those actinomycete back, um, uh, uh, fungi that are helping to break down a lot of those materials. So um, it should smell good. It shouldn't smell bad. If it smells rotten, it is not ready. And you, you need to try and figure out how to fix that. Um, so uses, uh, you can mulch and fertilize with it. Uh, you can put one to two inches on your garden beds. Um, I do that every year. Um, I, got my soil, I got my soil tested last year. Uh, through um, the Connecticut agricultural testing, whatever, and uh, it was free, which was nice. Um, but their recommendation, and they they put this on uh, literally everyone's soil test. They say to everyone, um, you know, add one to two inches if you're doing like vegetables or have a garden bed. Add one to two inches every year. Like that's just literally what they put on everyone. So I would recommend it for sure. It's um, helping to bring in good microorganisms, um, a good balance of nutrients. Um, it's gonna help uh, aerate your soil and help with water retention. It's, it has a lot of really good physical and chemical benefits to it. Compost tea is not to drink. Let me be very clear about that. That is not, I know people are really into the probiotic stuff these days. I love it, I'm all about kombucha, but compost tea is not for consumption. Um, let me be very clear about that. And is it worth it? I, you know, I, I've made compost tea. It's fine. Um, you know, the benefit is it adds some nutrients. I'll, I gotta be honest with you. It's actually not all that much because it's a bag of compost that you put in a little canvas bag and then you put into your five gallon bucket and let it sit and mix it up every, you know, um, maybe twice a day for a few days. It might start to get, you know, you might start to smell it a little bit, you know, it might smell a little earthy um, and you can water your plants. Um, yeah, so plants do absorb some nutrients from their leaves, uh, but they're not going to get a whole lot from compost tea. Um, I guess if you're working with some fairly nutrient deficient soil um, or maybe some kind of, you know, dead dirt, dirt is kind of dead soil if you think of it uh, that way. So if you're just kind of working with some dirt, um, yeah, it could be helpful. You can, you know, water your house plants with it. Um, it's got good microorganisms that are going to help to support your soil's immune system. So that's a way to think about it. Um, but do you have to do compost tea? No. Um, at that point, you know, I would just say just toss an inch to two inches on your garden beds. Um, that would that would be probably more effective at that point. So, but compost tea is fun. It's you know I've talked to, about it with my students. Um, so it is has a lot of fun applications. Um, it's it, it is good in that way. I did say uh, also uh, some people add molasses to help feed the microorganisms. So um, the molasses in it, just make sure that it's not sulfured uh, because that would prevent microorganisms from growing if you want to add a little bit, like a tablespoon would probably be enough for, for, for a bucket. All right, so let's talk about composting problems, smelly bins and other problems. So what if it smells rotten and if it's not breaking down? Um, if that's the case, you might have too, many, too much green material, uh, too little air, um, or you have excess water. You have too much water in that case. So um, most, of, most of my recommendations to, to help your compost problems are usually add more brown material, turn your pile, and then maybe add some brown material on top. So if, especially if you're getting that really, you know, kind of ammonia smell, I've gotten it before in my piles. And so what I do is I just add some brown material, mix it up so that, you know, it helps to, to um, bring some of that carbon further into my pile. And then I would cover it. Uh, you'd actually be pretty surprised at how well uh, com, uh, carbon material can cover up smells. It actually does a very good job of it. So even straw, like I was saying earlier, or wood chips would be a, a very effective way to cover up the smell. 
Um, pests and critters. So there are some little critters that are really good for your pile and obviously others that are not. So things like, yeah, centipedes, pill bugs, um, um, uh, black soldier fly larvae. I've actually got a, a picture on my next slide about that, um, of what they look like. They kind of look like maggots, but they're not. So, it, you know, if, you've, if you know what you're looking for, you can rest assured whether or not what you've got in your pile is good or bad. Um, if you got things like fruit flies, rodents, etc., consider what it is you're putting in. So yeah, that meat, that dairy, um, fats, those are going to attract um, um, rodents and other kinds of pests. Uh, so again, if you're attracting critters, just put brown material on it. Um, that's going to cover it up. That's going to um, cut down on the smell. It's going to cut down on access. Um, so really brown material is like one of the saviors in composting, I got to say. Um, and if you're still getting critters, then try an enclosed bin. Um, and, uh, and what about if they're in your food scrap bucket? Um, if you're getting fruit flies in your food scrap bucket, consider a lid that's gonna seal up a little bit better. So for a while I was using a, a, a standard good old fashioned five gallon lid, but that was really exhausting for my fingertips. That's why I got that spinny one. Um, I got it from Lowe's, it was seven bucks. So, um, but that would be a good, a good option. So make sure that it gets covered up. Okay, so this is a picture of black soldier fly larvae. Um, they might look like maggots, but they're not. So, so rest assured that actually these things are good and they are, um, uh, they're good to have in your pile. If you see them, don't worry about them. Don't try and throw them out. Don't try and get rid of them. Um, they are actually doing a really good job at helping to break down some of those larger bits and pieces um, so that also the microorganisms can get to it as well. So. Uh, the first time I saw them, I panicked a little bit and, and you know, tried to shoo them away. But, um, you know, once you learn a little bit more, you realize, okay, actually, these are really good uh, composting friends. So they are beneficial to have. Um, but yeah, I'd say that you Google it, you know, everyone can do that nowadays. If you don't know what you're looking at, look it up on Google and, and you'll be able to figure out if it's something like maggots, which might be because you're putting in the wrong kind of material or it's black soldier fly larvae that are um, actually really good for your pile. Um, recommendations for getting rid of mites, someone is asking. Um, recommendations for mites. Um, I don't know that I really have a good recommendation. If you, can I, can I ask more of like, what, what does the pile look like if it's, I don't know that I've seen much in the way of mites being a big problem. Um, yeah, I don't really have a good specific tip for that. Oh, okay. So it's in the worm bin. Um, that makes a that makes a difference. So if it's in a worm bin and you got mites, um, it might mean having to think about not not starting over because you know you don't want to throw out your worms, but it might mean having to start off with a smaller population and getting rid of of some of the stuff that you've got in there. Um, it can be difficult to get you know some of those smaller ones out. So if you notice basically a, like a mite infestation. That might be a sign to um, maybe try hitting the, the reset button in a way with your bin. That might be my, my best advice. Um, other issues with, with worm bins might be getting fruit flies and that kind of a thing. Uh, with a worm bin, usually it's got a bunch of holes in it. So it might mean putting a little bit of screening on those holes. So you still get the oxygen because the worm's got to breathe. Um, but it, it might mean um, maybe getting like a screen material to cover up those holes um, and try and see if there's other openings around the lid that might be, uh, you know, getting, giving them access to getting in. Um, someone was asking, so will the maggot look like be in the soil when I put it in my garden? Um, no, they're actually more focused on breaking down some of those food scraps and other things that you have in your pile specifically. Um, so after a period of time, you're going to notice less and less of them. Uh, as your compost matures and it as, as it actually becomes a finished compost product, uh, you shouldn't see them anymore. Um, or if you do, then just don't use that part and just use the part that, that does look fine. But they won't be a problem in your, in your soil, though. They wouldn't be harmful. And I don't think that they would stick around for too long. Once they go through their metamorphosis to become flies, I, they, they're not going to have much interest in, in your soil. So I wouldn't worry too much about the, the, the larvae. Okay, so here's a question that some people ask is, should you turn your pile? I like to turn my pile. Um, there are some good reasons to do it, um, but 
I have, I have found in the New York City Master Composter Manual, which is free. You can look it up online. You can just get free access to it. It's a great manual. Um, uh, uh, I, I've used it as a reference numerous times. Um, they do say in there that um, if you turn your pile, the idea was that you'd help to really let the pile breathe a whole lot and re, you know, um, reinvigorate it for a long period of time. You do briefly, but the oxygen also still gets used up. Um, by those microorganisms. So um, usually within an hour, maybe two, you might have the oxygen levels in your pile return back to normal. Um, and it can disturb microbiomes. Some people are very, you know, um, they want to set up their compost bin and just add green material and, and brown and kind of do a lasagna approach, which, which could work. Um, by layering that material, you're still helping to them to kind of mix together in, in, the, in the larger scheme of your pile. Um, some people get really, you know, touchy-feely about the microbes and don't get me wrong, I love them. They are literally like the ones that are doing all the labor in this. Um, I don't worry about disturbing them, they're fine. They're not gonna be that bothered by, by turning it. Um, but here's some good reasons is by mixing up your pile, you help to redistribute material for decomposer access. You're creating new air pathways. You're breaking up anaerobic pockets. So as you're, as you're turning your pile, you might get a little bit of an aroma. And if you do, that's a good sign for you to turn your pile then if you get a little bit of that, that smell. Um, and it redistributes moisture. So. Mixing, I say, is good for your pile. It can be a little, a little tiring, a little exhausting, um, but it's, it's, I think it can be worth it, um, depending on the tool that you're using for it. Um, so what's taking so long? Sometimes it seems like your compost pile takes forever. Um, it might just be the size. Um, so, you know, uh, it can depend on the size of the pile. Again, that the uh, cubic yard is going to be, you know, a good size for it to keep its thermal mass, you know, so it can stay warm. Um, the size of the contents. So are you chopping up large pieces or are you just throwing in whole ones? So, like I said, you know, maybe it's okay for you to toss in large pieces. Um, in the three bin system that is at the Reservoir Park Community Garden, we're putting a lot of yard waste in there. And honestly, I'm okay with it just going in as a pull up your plant, toss it in, it'll break down. We don't need to have it, you know, in, you know, February. So it can, it can sit and it can, it can last a little while, but you know, so sometimes it might take a little while. Um, location of the pile, um, not so much, I would say, but it could be a little bit of a factor, um, you know, if it has access to decomposers. Um, and why is my compost cold? Some piles just don't get hot and that's okay if your compost doesn't get hot. It is very satisfying to see your compost pile steaming, you know, early in the morning as the sun's coming up in your, in your garden and then there's a compost pile steaming, you know, uh, like a big you know, mug of coffee or whatever, that is satisfying, but it's not, it, it doesn't have to get hot for it to break down. Um, the U.S. Composting Council on, you know, more of a municipal scale on a, you know, um, uh, a larger scale, they are very picky about their temperatures. They're picky about uh, what's going into it. Um, so they, they, they're, they're very precise about that sort of stuff. But in your backyard, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, so now what? Um, so first thing is going to be choosing your system. What kind of what kind of pile do you want? Is it going to be a bin, a heap? Is it going to be a tumbler? Um, and then add greens and browns to it. Uh, so you're going to want to make sure you've got some brown material. This is a good time of year. Um, if you don't have a lot of leaves, maybe you know a guy who's got a lot of leaves. Uh, so maybe talk to them about about you know and just grab their bag and then you can just walk away with it and you've got your your pile of browns that you can access you know at least for probably a few months as you're you're adding stuff to your pile. Um, Turn it once or twice a month. You can, you don't have to, um, but that does help to redistribute things. Uh, manage moisture, so add browns if it's too wet, um, you know, or vice versa. And then be patient. Honestly, sometimes it can take up to a year. Um, those bins, you know, those sit, if you were to buy a bin, someone will tell you, oh yeah, you're gonna get fresh compost in two months, just like that. And it's like, it depends on a lot of factors. Um, if you've got all your materials up front and you fill up your bin, you bring your bin home and you fill it up with, um, you know, grass clippings and, and brown leaves, then yeah, you might get compost in two months, three months or so. But if you're starting fresh, you're slowly adding things to it. I hate to say it, but you just got to be a little patient with it. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, from here, I've just got some fun stuff, some fun applications about composting. Um, so 
Uh, we are we are very close to the end. I realize we're a little bit over on our time. I apologize for that. Um, I'm going to go through these slides real quick, and then and then I'm happy to take more questions. Um, but hey, if you got a big enough pile, you can generate enough heat to uh, heat up your water. Why not? You know, if you got the right materials for it, I've heard of farms doing this where they get a lot of you know wood chips and straw as they're brown, and they get a lot of horse manure and mixing those together. And horse manure is going to be a great. Uh, green. So you've got greens, you've got browns, um, mix them together, make sure they've got access to, to oxygen. A pile of this size that's on my screen, you, if you can see the little guy there for comparison, uh, it's, it's big. Um, a lot of times they'll also put hollow pipes through it with little holes drilled in just as a, a, another way to, to um, help um, aerate the pile. So they don't have to turn it, it will just continue to get airflow through these little pipes that they'll lay through them. Um, so yeah, I mean, the basic idea is you got your, your hot water, or I should say your cold water, going through pipes in your compost pile. If it's big enough and hot enough, it warms it up and it just sends it right back into your house. Um, so this is how, this was uh, at Cornell University, I believe. Um, someone had set it up, this was back in 2012. Uh, so you can see all the little coils and they had them weighed down and they keep adding to the pile. It keeps getting bigger. Um, and they were able to make it large enough to generate enough heat to, to heat up some water for a while. Um, so that might be an interesting uh, alternative energy source to consider is, is biomass, right? I mean, this is a good example of it. Um, Another interesting application is uh, uh, in the in the end of life processes. Um, it sounds like Washington. Actually, this is an old article. I apologize. It has updated. Washington State did legalize uh, composting human remains, um, so the option of soil instead of ashes. Um, to get into the science very quickly, you are very nitrogen dense, you are green, uh, and so they'd need a lot of brown. And so uh, they would, um, you know, uh, mix you with probably wood chips. That would be a really good source of carbon to mix with your nitrogen. And uh, after a few months, your family gets a bag of compost that, you know, so kind of like getting, you know, ashes in an urn, but you can toss it in a garden, you know, so that's, that, that might be an interesting way to honor someone's life. Um, and this is just a fun little song that I put up on the, on the I, I, I just found the lyrics to this today. Um, so this was a song by someone named Lee Hayes of the Weavers, a folk group who sang in the uh, 40s and 50s, and I guess they were blacklisted during the McCarthy era for un-American ideas and you know all that sort of good stuff. So um, if I should die before I wake, all my bones and sin you take, put me in the compost pile and decompose me for a while. Wind, water, rain will have their way, returning me to common clay. All that I am will feed the trees and little fishes in the seas. On radishes and corn you munch, you might be having me for lunch, and then excrete me with a grin, chortling, there goes Lee again. So a little, 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 little potty humor for you at the end, I apologize about that, so. But there you go, folks. This is, um, this, yeah, I've got some more resources if you're interested. Uh, you know, I can put this slide back up on my screen in a second. Um, again, you know, I, shout out to the Yukon Master Composter Program. They've got free resources. So does um, Penn State. They've got the, the extension program through there. It has a lot of awesome resources. Um, the Cornell Waste Management Institute um, is inundated with all sorts of different ideas, different things. They've got things for teachers, um, for composting in the classroom. They've got things for municipal scale, for backyards, for worm bins. Worm bins, they've got stuff for that too. So I would say um, um, take a look at that for, for more information. Um, oh, and shout out to the, uh, the next webinar on December 3rd, I believe I got the date right for that one, uh, for the next uh, community gardening around the village. Uh, the theme is holiday swags. Uh, great for families. Um, please make sure though that you, um, when you sign up, let the library, I believe it's through the library, please correct me if I'm wrong, but let them yes. know if you plan on getting the materials because that's something that they want to make sure they have set aside for folks that will be getting the materials. Great. That takes oh, us to the end thank you. of- Thank you, Tom. That was just wonderful. Thank you. Tom, thank thanks. You. Yeah, there's a couple more questions in the uh, chat there for you. Yes, uh, Phoenixville has a free soil testing service. Um, that's a good question um, to, to find uh, free testing, soil testing services. Uh, most of the universities, I would suspect that, that the extension through PSU 
um, would probably have a soil testing service that might come with like a $20 charge or something, but that will also, it'll, it's, it's nice. It comes back with a whole summary of um, the different micronutrients in your soil. Um, you know, you, you also tell them like, hey, this is a vegetable garden or I want to grow tomatoes or, you know, I'm going to plant uh, carrots or whatever. And they can tell you things like um, the texture of the soil, what sort of things you might need to add to it, um, you know, that, that sort of thing. So um, I don't know off the top of my head for the Phoenixville area about a free soil testing service, but I'd probably reach out to the extension um, uh, program. So like the master gardeners, um, uh, they might have, have some good information about that specifically. Now uh, there's one more question. It was sent to me privately. Uh, if my compost freezes, is it dead? Uh, good question. I would not worry about frozen compost. Obviously, it's not going to break down like in the middle of winter. Um, definitely anticipate that your compost will at least slow down, if not stop. Um, and that's okay. Um, it'll start back up again once it warms up, once it thaws. Um, so I wouldn't worry about, about a dead pile necessarily. Once it thaws, it's, it's all going to come back. The microorganisms, you know, they're going to get frozen, but they're, they're, you know, they're pretty hardy, actually. They're going to survive that. Uh, could I put half-made compost on my beds for winter? Interesting. So if the, I would say if the beds don't have anything in them, for example, I just planted some garlic. Um, I would probably not put half finished compost if there's stuff that I just planted or on, on fresh plants necessarily. Um, but if you're just gonna set aside your garden beds, let them rest for the winter, you could probably toss them in, maybe even mix it in a little bit, that'd be okay. Um, and, and I would also probably recommend covering it as well with uh, maybe a layer of straw. Um, that's usually pretty effective as a mulch. One of the things that uh, was suggested to me is to fill the compost bin with all the dry leaves. And then as I have kitchen garbage, just sort of bury it in as I go. Uh, I tried that one year, filling the whole thing with leaves, and I was surprised by spring, I had half a barrel left. Yeah, uh, it, it decompresses a lot. It does. It really shrinks down. Hmm. Um, but I would say that would be effective. Yes. Uh, if you if you want to just toss a bunch of leaves in there and then gradually add in your, your, your greens, you want to consider mixing it in um, instead of just, you know, layering it on top. But if you're mixing it in, with what's nice about those leaves, those crunchy leaves, is um, uh, you know they're, they're going to be easy to mix with. So that's good. Uh, but yeah, as your compost continues um, and breaks down, uh, you're going to notice it shrink in volume, which is really interesting because if you think about it, like what, what where is it going? Well, uh, because those microorganisms are going through cellular respiration, they're all exhaling. So they're taking the carbon and oxygen that is in your pile and turning it into a gas and it is leaving. So that mass is literally floating away. Um, so it's just an interesting thing to consider, but well, your pile will, will shrink. Well, I have one of those, those barrels that uh, through the Chester County, they would give away the barrels if you promised to take their composting class. So I had two barrels because I took it two different years. Um, and as I said, I filled them totally with leaves. And I found out, that, and I don't even turn it, I just leave it there. I just sort of bury the garbage in, you know, my kitchen garbage in, in the middle of it so it's covered. Um, but out of, those, out of those barrels, I must have gotten maybe 12 inches of mm -hmm. stuff. Otherwise, I mean, the barrel was, was probably is three feet tall. Mm -hmm. but all I got was about one foot. Of yeah, so, so you're getting not a whole lot of, of compost out of it. No, I'm not. Gotcha. Um, yeah, um, that's probably just going to be the case with it. If you, because it does shrink down a lot. It, it does. As it, as it breaks down, it's going to physically have a smaller volume. Um, so what would I recommend aside from, I mean, just Either get either a bigger bin, more materials, um, so you know, just more leaves, more more food scraps. Um, at that point, I don't know. It's tough to generate more food scraps, though. You kind of have an amount that you produce, so it's kind of tough to get more necessarily. And the um, other question I have of food scraps: Can you put in like a, a rotten uh, food, for example, a, a uh, or an orange that had de turned blue? Can you put it with mold on it? Can you put something yes. with mold into it? Yes. Yeah. If it's, if it is a rotten piece of fruit, it can go into your compost pile. Um, it will, if it's moldy and, and, you know, different colors and, 
you, you know, it looks like it is going to start to try and talk to you because it's that, you know, that rotten, um, that can go into your compost pile. It is okay. Uh, that, in fact, I'm going to bet that probably the mold that's in your fruit, because it's breaking down your fruit, is actually probably going to be helpful in your compost pile because it's going to help to continue to break it down. But that shouldn't be a danger. Once it goes through and it actually breaks down, that shouldn't be an issue for the compost that you use at the end. Thank you. All right, Tom, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for logging on tonight. Uh, you'll be able to find this video on Phoenixville Library's YouTube channel sometime next week. And uh, hope to see you guys at the uh, next event, our uh, virtual uh, craft uh, program, for making uh, holiday swags. So something to bright up, brighten up the holidays this year for sure. We, we definitely need that. Tom, thanks again. And uh, all right. Oh, one more question in the uh, chat there. Go ahead. Yes, I see one says, uh, can poison ivy go on a compost pile? Um, I would be careful. Well, first off, obviously handling it. You know, you want to be careful about that. Um, I mean, if you've got like a lot of poison ivy that you need to do something with, that might, I don't know that I would put it into a compost pile. If it's a small amount, you know, once it goes through the decomposition process, some of those oils will probably break down as well as, as the microorganisms are really doing their work. Um, so I think in a small amount, I don't think that it would be a big issue, although I, I got to say, I don't know for sure. Um, so I, I, I'll, I'll be, you know, transparent about that. Um, but if it's a lot, I would be, I would be cautious to put a lot of poison ivy into my compost pile. Yeah, so uh, Raina says it might take root, so that is certainly something to be careful of. Yeah. And also thank you to Raina for the, uh, it looks like put a link into the chat box about the Penn State Extension soil test. Um, nine bucks, that is not a bad price actually, I gotta say. Um, but you can you can amp it up, it sounds like multiple, you know, get, get tested for a lot of things, so. Thanks again, Tom. Sure thing. Thank you for this having me. Just wonderful. Yep, great job. Great job. Yeah, look forward to the recording. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank mm -hmm. you. I'm glad you were able to join us. Thank you. All right. With that, we will say good night. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take it